All right, so you know it is Vision Sunday today, right? Vision Sunday. And, and I love this Sunday because what this is all about is this is a time for where, where I've been praying and I've been kind of in my uh, prayer closet, if you will, asking the Lord, what is our word? What is a phrase that will maybe just kind of define this next season of ministry that we're going into? And to be honest, I was kind of hoping that we would have this in early January or mid-January, late January. And I was like, Lord, I'm not getting anything. I don't feel like I have a word right now. And, and I don't want to just make something up. I'm not going to do that either. You know, so I was like, Lord, I really need something. I want to have some clear vision, direction for our church as we go forward into this next season of 2022. And, you know, a lot of people would say, that uh, vision and mission are two things that they've heard of, especially in business, right? You have a, a mission statement and you have a vision statement a lot of times. And a lot of people will kind of get those confused and they'll think that they're interchangeable. And they're actually vastly different uh, in what they do, but they do work together in kind of crafting what the business, the organization is all about. Mission statements simply define an organization and its objectives. It's more of a definition of who we are, what we do, why we exist. And many times you'll see mission statements that says we exist to, or we do this. And maybe for example, there might be uh, a company and, and they, they are trying to help provide water, okay? And so they might say something like this, our mission is to provide clean water to underdeveloped countries. Now that's a very clear mission statement. When you hear that, you automatically know this is probably a nonprofit organization and they're trying to provide clean water to underdeveloped countries in all kinds of different ways. They might have different methods for doing that, but you know exactly what that company is when you hear that. And the mission is never changing. That is never gonna change. That will always be the mission statement of that organization unless they have a massive overhaul or something like that, but it will never change. And our mission at Radical Church is never changing as well. Radical is a word that the Lord gave me back in 2017, and we put it into our mission statement. And it is to help people experience the radical love of Jesus. Come on, isn't that a great mission? To help people experience the radical love of Jesus. Because we believe that the love of Jesus isn't just passive. We believe it's not just small, but it is a love that is beyond all of our understanding. And aren't you grateful that Jesus has that kind of love for you and for me? And we want other people to experience that love as well. And so that is our mission, people experiencing Jesus being taught about Jesus, right? And, and then being sent out to preach Jesus, maybe not in full-time ministry necessarily, but, but just the way that you live your everyday life preaches who Jesus is, right? And so that is our mission. But a vision statement is different. A vision statement is simply a desired future position of an organization, a desired future position of an organization. And, and this could be across different time periods, right? So it could be a quarterly vision. Let's say, for example, we'd like to see X number of clients in the, in the next quarter. In Q2, we'd like to see this many clients in our organization. It could be a yearly vision. We'd like to increase our social following to 1 million followers across all social platforms by the end of 2022. That's a clear vision statement for the year. It could even be a five to 10 year vision statement. Let's go back to that company from earlier that says their mission is to provide clean water to underdeveloped countries. They might say a vision statement would be, we wanna see a hundred water wells built in South America over the next 10 years. Now, when you hear that, you're like, wow, that is amazing. They have a mission that de defines the organization and now they have a vision. It puts some bones and some flesh and some skin around what they're actually trying to do. Where are we headed? What's the rallying point for our organization? And that would be their rallying point right there. That is their vision statement. And the Bible talks about vision actually in multiple different places. You see the Old Testament prophets, they were getting visions, they would get dreams. Maybe sometimes they would interpret dreams. You see that in a few instances in the Old Testament too. And in the New Testament, it's there as well, but it's more prevalent in the Old Testament for sure. You hear lots of stories about, and the Lord gave me a vision and the Lord gave me a dream or something like that. And then they just go through and all the prophets you kind of see, it's amazing. But there's one particular passage that I wanna look at today that I think really helps us. And there's some practical things that we can take out of this passage for what we should do for a God-given vision. It's found... In Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3, everybody say Habakkuk. There you go. You got it. Come on. And the Lord answered me, 
write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Now that is a powerful thing for the Lord to say to Habakkuk in that moment. And if you know what this, this uh, book of the Bible is, it's not a long one. It is very, very short. And you find Habakkuk in this conversation with God. In fact, he's actually complaining to the Lord is what it says. You look in the little subtitles that sometimes your, your Bible will put in, they kind of add in these little sections to help you kind of understand. If you know the Bible wasn't actually written in chapters and verses, they put those in much later, uh, but sometimes they have these little sections and it says Habakkuk's complaint number one, and then it, the Lord will answer. And then it literally goes to the Habakkuk's second complaint. And then the Lord's answer. It's just these sections. How many of you ever complained to the Lord before? You, come on, raise your hand. If you're not, you're lying, okay? You are just an absolute liar today in the house. You need to get right with the Lord, okay? Uh, but Habakkuk is upset. He is upset because there has been this rampant, just evil all throughout the nation of Judah, God's people. And Habakkuk is a part of this nation and he's one of the prophets of God. And he's saying, Lord, aren't you gonna punish these people that are just not following your commands? Why are they, they're not doing what you've asked them to do. And Lord, you're, I know you're a God of justice, Lord. So, so, you know, kind of like avenge yourself in a sense, like make right what has been wrong. These people need to be following you, Lord. What are you doing? And then the Lord answers him. This is Habakkuk 1. We're gonna get to, to what we just read in a second. And the Lord answers, he says, you know what? You're absolutely right. So I'm gonna raise up the Chaldeans to do that. And if you know anything about the Chaldeans, they're otherwise known as the Babylonians in some areas, but uh, the Chaldeans were not the greatest of people, okay? Not a great nation. They were evil people. They were running rampant all throughout. They were just conquering people left and right. And so then Habakkuk is like, okay, great that you're gonna punish the people, but like now I have my second complaint. Why them? Why are you using those people? We don't like those people. Why are you using these evil, evil people to punish your chosen people? God, that doesn't make sense either. And so then God responds to Habakkuk with this passage right here, right after he makes that complaint. He says, hey, listen, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You need to write it down and do all these different things. And this is what we're going to go to today. He asked him to do a few different things. And the message, if I had to put a title to it, it would be the four keys to vision. You could put four keys to a God-given vision as well. If you're taking notes, man, I'd encourage you to do that today. This is gonna help, be helpful for you in your life, but also is gonna define where we are going forward as a church. And so I wanna make sure that you know who we are and where we're going. And the first thing that the Lord tells Habakkuk to do is he says what? He says to write it down. Somebody say, write it down. Write it down. It's not just okay to hear the vision. You gotta write it down somewhere, okay? I, I don't know about you, but I am definitely a person that if I don't write something down, it's not happening, okay? Especially as I've gotten to be a little bit older, I had a lot more responsibility. When I was in high school, you know, honestly, I didn't get things done then either. You gotta get your homework done, right? You have all these projects in college and different assignments and stuff. But as you get older, you just understand you got a lot more things to think about. There's a lot more that's weighing on you as an adult with kids and maybe your job and, and especially starting a church and having so many people around. Listen, I'll tell you, after church, sometimes I have 10 people come up to me and say, hey, pastor, can we do this? Or, hey, pastor, can we, you know, meet about this? Or can we talk about this at some point? And listen, if I don't write it down, it's not gonna happen. Like, I will not remember it, okay? And some of you are like, yeah, that's right, because you said that we were gonna do this and we never, we never did. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down, okay? So I have to be very vigilant uh, to actually, sometimes I will do this. If you come and talk to me after service, it kind of might be a little offensive to some people, but you'll be in the middle of a conversation with me and you'll say, hey, can we talk about this? And I will always say, hey, can you hold on just one second? Hold on one second. Remind me to meet with so-and-so tomorrow morning. And I, well, I will put it in Siri. Siri is my best friend. If I don't have Siri, nothing gets done, okay? I'm just gonna be completely honest with you guys. And so I will actually pause the conversation and say, hey, can you hold on one minute? I gotta write this down. I gotta put it in my phone because if I don't, there's no way I'm gonna remember it. It might seem a little bit offensive at first to just kind of cut somebody off like that. But actually, if you really think about it, I would hope that you would be honored by it because what I think you're saying is so important. I don't want to forget it. So I have to write it down. And how many times does the Lord speak to us? And maybe we're listening maybe halfway and we kind of hear something from the Lord, but we don't write it down. 
What does that say about how we view God's word and view the revelation that the Lord gives us? If you feel like he's speaking to you and yet we don't even write this thing down, are we honoring the Lord's word to us? Are we honoring when we say that we're in this relationship with him and we speak to him and we just speak to him and we speak to him, we speak to him and he's trying to get through to us. He's trying to give you a vision for your life but yet you're just either ignoring him or you're just talking so much he can't even get through. And then when he finally does get through and you feel like you hear something, you don't even care enough to write it down. Listen, I'm telling you, if I get a God-given vision from the Lord, I'm writing it on a post-it note. I'm writing it on my phone. I'm writing it on my notes app. I'm writing it all over the place. I'm gonna stick it on my wall. I'm gonna stick it. I'm gonna make a frame painting out of it. You know what I'm saying? When I got the word radical back in 2017, I wrote it down immediately, immediately, because I knew that there was something there. And every other word that I've ever been given from the Lord, I have a note in my phone that has about 15 to 20 different things that the Lord has told me and spoken to me over my life. Things that have already happened that I'm like, man, I just wanna remind myself of what the Lord said and the things that he accomplished, the things that he did. Things that are, I'm living out right now, as I see all of you, this is a word from the Lord that he gave me that I'm living in currently. And then there's words that have yet to come to pass but I have every single one of them written down because I honor the Lord and I honor and I care about what he says. And I hope that you would too. And you have to ask the Lord, what am I about? Like, what step is God asking me to take in this next season of my life? And if he tells you something, write it down. Maybe you have a family, you say, what is God calling us to? What I want you to do is I want you to take some time and pray and ask God, what is a vision that you have for our family? Where do you want us to go with our next step as a family? And let me tell you, you need to write it down and share that with your kids. Share it with your kids. Let them know what the expectations are for our family as we go into 2022, as we move into 2023, as you're getting older. Hey, this is what I feel like the Lord says over you. This is what the Lord is saying over our family. And write this down, make those expectations clear because you know if you don't give your kids clear expectations, what are they gonna do? They're gonna go off and do their own thing. They're gonna think you said one thing or they're gonna take advantage and say, oh, well, you said, it's like, no, 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 listen, it is right here. Okay, we wrote this down. This is what I feel like the Lord is telling us to do and this is what we're gonna do as a family. And listen, if you don't write it down, the world will definitely give them a vision to follow. The world will. If you don't write it down for yourself, listen, the world will tell you what to do. The world will say, hey, you should go over here and you should date this person. You should do this. You should care more about money than you do about family. You should care more about things than you do about God. You should do this. You should go and take this job. You should move here and do this. And, and the world will have all kinds of things to say. I guarantee it. Hollywood has all kinds of visions for what they think that you should be living your life like. And I guarantee you, almost every single one of them is not what God would have for you. The world will write your vision for you if you don't get it from God himself and write it down for yourself. That's why we have so many people wandering around confused with no vision. I, I can't tell you how many times I've counseled high school and college students and even people older than that, to be honest, into their 20s and 30s that still have no idea what they're doing in their lives. They still have no clue. And I understand there's high school and college kids and that's when they're trying to figure this out. Like, I just need some direction. Pastor, can you help me? I'm like, have you prayed about it? And they're like, uh, not yet. I'm like, well, don't talk to me until you pray about it. Why are you coming to me first? You think I'm gonna, you think God's gonna speak to me specifically for you right now when you haven't even gone to him first? Absolutely not. You go pray and then come back and talk to me. And then you tell me what you heard. That's what I would say to somebody that feels like they don't have direction in their lives. God has a vision for your life, but you have to slow down enough to be able to hear it and then hopefully you would care enough to write it down because you have to be able to hold it up. Say, this is the vision that the Lord has for my life and this is what the world is saying. This is what my family's saying. This is what my friends are saying and if they do not match up, then it is not from the Lord, right? You have to be able to know what it is. The second thing is, after you write it down, when you're writing it down really, you have to make it Plain. Somebody say, make it plain. Make it plain. Sometimes plain things are better. Sometimes making it a little bit more plain and a little less complicated is better. Does anybody have awful 
handwriting in this place today. Let me see if you got awful handwriting. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Well, a lot of people have awful handwriting. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. My wife would say that I have terrible handwriting. Hers is so much better. She's one of those people. It's so annoying, right? Like they just like, they don't even try. And then it just looks like calligraphy. And it's just like, she's just going like this and it looks absolutely gorgeous. I'm like, how do you do that? And so I'm just writing and I, and I just look like a doctor when I'm writing. You know, it looks just straight chicken scratch, you know? Doctors have the worst handwriting of all time. If you're a doctor, you would understand. You probably have awful handwriting. You're one of those people that raise your hand. You're like, hey, he's talking about me right now. Yes, we know you have awful handwriting. Uh, and, and I honestly feel like it seems like they have a class for that. They pro- When you were in medical school, all you doctors and nurses out there, I know they had a class. It was illegible handwriting 101. I guarantee that you had that class when you went through school. But I understand it's, it's more about speed than it is clarity, right? Because they're visiting with so many patients every day. They got to get in, they got to get out. And sometimes you might feel rushed when you go to a doctor. It's because honestly, they have so many patients to visit with. It's, it's difficult for them to get in and out. And when they write those scripts, they're going so fast. Sometimes I'm like, man, this might not be good if that was misinterpreted. And in fact, they have shorthand. There's a few things, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this later, nurses and doctors, you might get me on this one. But uh, there's one that I found. It says QD, which is a Latin phrase. It's one a day. Or TID is three times a day. And your pharmacist will know what that means, okay? And I certainly don't know what that means. Uh, but to you, that means absolutely nothing. It's just chicken scratch, right? You're like, what is this T? And you can barely even read it, right? But the doctors, they have to be extra careful when they're writing these scripts because, you know, one small little mistake could be the difference between life and death in somebody. They have to be very careful. For example, instead of writing MG, if you write MCG, those mean two completely different things, all right? One would be milligram and the other is microgram. That's a hundred times difference. And you have to be very, very careful. In fact, a 2006 study of this exact thing found that more than 7,000 people a year died from medical errors caused by illegible handwriting. Now, how would you like to go that way? You get to heaven and you're like, God, what happened? And you're like, well, A doctor just sucked at writing. So sorry, and now you're here. Really? That's how I went? For real? Yeah, sorry. There's more than 7,000 years. You know that? That's crazy. You know, like that's awful. And Habakkuk 2.2 in the CEV version, I like how it puts this. Write it clearly enough to be read at a glance. I like that. Write the vision clearly enough to be read at a glance. Don't just write the vision. Make it plain. Somebody say it. Make it plain. It needs to be when you're trying to read a text over somebody's shoulder kind of plain. You know, if you're like standing there, you're trying to read a text over somebody's shoulder and there's like a paragraph and you're just standing there trying to read this whole thing. Like, ah, it's not going to, eventually they're going to be like, what are you doing? Get away from me. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm trying to figure this out. What's going on? You know, but then if you have like a one sentence sort of thing and you can just go like, oh, so that's what's going on in Sarah's life. Okay. Okay. Cool. What's up? What's up? What's up? You know, like you can just sneak that real quick. They don't even know. Right. Because it was one sentence. It was two sentences. It was easy. Listen, your vision for your life should not be a 19-year-old white girl Starbucks order. You know what I'm talking about? I'd like a venti ice, skinny hazelnut macchiato, sugar-free syrup, extra shot, light ice, no whip vision. Thank you very much. No! I need a black coffee vision in this place today. Something that everybody understands. When you get a black coffee, you know what you're getting, right? Everyone knows what that tastes like. It might not be for you, I understand, but every, that is a universal thing that everybody can understand. Everyone knows what that means. Well, the problem is, is if your vision for your life is unclear, it will be a lot like the telephone game. You ever played that before? I played it all, all a bunch of times. We actually played, there's a new version of that actually that we play where you write pictures and you pass it around. It's a lot of fun. And so um, you, you play this game and you basically have a word or a phrase and you tell it to somebody or, and then basically it goes all the way around and it gets back to you. And many times if you're doing the picture or the phrase, it's completely different, not even close to the initial thing that you said. And here's the problem. When God gives you a vision for your life and if you don't write it down and you don't make it plain enough and it's too complicated and you're trying to communicate this to maybe a family member, you're trying to communicate this to your family, trying to communicate it to your spouse or to a close trusted friend and you're saying, hey, this is where I feel like the Lord is leading me in my life. What do you think about this? How do you feel about this? And maybe if it's not clear enough, they will reinterpret it 
and then give it back to you. And then now you're more confused. And then this spouse of yours is reinterpreting it and sending it back. And your friend is reinterpreting it and sending it back. By the time it gets back to you, it's not even the same thing anymore because it wasn't clear in the first place. It needs to be one sentence, two sentences. And God is not a God of chaos. Let me tell you, God's not gonna give you a vision that is so complicated that you can't even understand it. When God gave me the word radical, it was radical. That was it. And then he confirmed it two days later when the lady comes up and starts grabbing my hand out of the air in the prayer meeting and saying radical vision, radical mission, radical preaching, radical worship, all this stuff. And I immediately knew that God was calling us to plant radical church. And if you asked me what my vision was for the next few years of my life back in 2017, I would have told you God's called me to plant a church. It's going to be called Radical Church. And I know exactly where it's going to be and I can't wait till we get there. Now, did it happen immediately? Absolutely not. But we'll talk about that in a second. The third one is run with it. Somebody say, run with it. Here's the problem with not having a clear vision. If it is not clear, you can't run with it. If it's not a clear vision, you can't run with it. You can't take that anywhere. There's no kind of communication that you can have. You're not able to figure out what are we working towards here. And in the business world, you might hear this phrase. You might hear it. It's called, what's the win? Somebody might say that. Say, well, what's the win here for this? And, and, and I like to ask myself that question a lot with everything we do here at Radical Church as well, but you might hear something like this. What's the one thing that we hope that this event accomplishes? If that one thing happens, that's, that's the win. And if it doesn't happen, then we shouldn't do it. Another question, what's the measurable results that we're looking for in this quarter? What's the win? Those are win-centered questions that you could ask your employees. And I would hope that as business leaders, you would ask these kinds of questions. And I try to ask myself even these questions for everything we do here at the church. They're crucial to the success of any business, your team, your nonprofit organization. They're universal. And why are these questions so important? And here's why. If you don't know the win, you won't. If you don't know the win, you won't. That's simply put. I had a pastor friend that was talking to me this last week. And I went down to San Antonio and just talking to him and a few other pastors. And and he said something that was really sad that was such a shame uh, for them in their church is that they would do exit interviews when he first got there. And even into a few years of him being there, people that had been let go and people that had just decided to quit and to move on into ministry or not into ministry, whatever it might be. And they would be doing these exit interviews and they would say, well, what do you, why is the reason why you think that this happened or why are you leaving or why do you think that you got let go? What's, what's going on here? Where was the disconnect? And they just said, you know what? Honestly, I just didn't know the win. I didn't know the win. I didn't know the win for my department. I didn't know what was the win for me in my specific job and what I was supposed to be doing every day. I had nothing really to work towards because I didn't know what we were working towards. And, and so I didn't know the win. And that's, I really think that that's why this went this way. And the pastor just said, man, that's such a shame because in Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And now that verse doesn't mean that you're literally going to die, okay? It doesn't mean if you don't have a vision for your life that the lightning strike is gonna come and get you. That's not what it means. But without vision, people quit. Without vision, people fail. Without vision, nobody is gonna win. Nobody wins when you don't have vision. And I like how it says it in the CSB version. I like this. Without revelation, people run wild, Without revelation, people run wild, but one who follows divine instruction will be happy. If you've ever been in business before, or if you've ever been an employee of a larger company, even this is pretty universal. If you have people that have a different vision, you have four or five people all with a different vision for where they think the company is going, and they're all running different directions, what's going to happen? You're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere because you're not all running in the same direction. Let's say you had, uh, you know, a bucket, right? And it's filled with water. And then you have four or five strings and you attach them to five horses and you send them all different directions. That bucket, where is it going to go? Absolutely nowhere. It's not going anywhere. But now let's say you attach those horses to something and you say, hey, I want all you go that direction all together. Where do you think you're going to go? 
really fast in the same direction. And it's so important in your life to be running the same direction with those around you, right? To be running the same way. But some people have very different visions for their lives that might not line up with where you're trying to get to. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always bad. I mean, there's some easy things to say no to. There's some people that might have a vision for their life that is just completely ungodly. It's not the way that I want to go at all. And so maybe I probably shouldn't be running with that person in a close manner, right? right? I'm not going to run with them real tight because uh, they have a different vision and I don't want their vision to confuse me from the vision that God has given me. But then there's some other people that they might have a vision, let's say to go into, man, I just feel like I want to go into full-time ministry. I just want to go into full-time ministry. I think that's great. That's amazing. And then you're thinking like, man, maybe I should go into ministry too. Listen, not all of us are called to be pastors. Like not all of us are called to be in ministry. Sometimes not every good vision is a God vision, right? Not every good vision is a God vision because maybe that's not what God is calling you to do. What is God calling you to do? It might not be the same thing as he's calling me to do. It might sound great, like, oh, I should, I should start this business because, you know, I have some other people starting businesses. It seems like it's going really well for them. I think that'd be a good idea. I'd probably be really great at that. But maybe that's not what God is calling you to do specifically. So you see somebody else doing it and you try to run whichever way that they're going. But now we're even confused because you're not going to God. You're looking to others to find your vision. You have to know what to say no to, but you have to know what to say yes to. And you might say now, okay, listen, Pastor Trevor, I, I have my vision already, okay? I already know what the Lord's calling me to do in the next year, the next two years, next five years, whatever it might be. You get this vision, you prayed about it, you're excited, you're ready to step into everything that God has for you, and then nothing, nothing happens after that. And that is so frustrating. I totally understand that. It's so frustrating when you feel like you've prayed and you've, worked so hard to, to find this vision, to hone it. You've made it plain. You've written it down. You gave me this vision, Lord. What's going on here? I mean, I wrote that word radical back in 2017 and our church didn't start until September of 2020. That's a long time to be waiting and to be preparing for the vision that God had given me for the next season of my life. But listen, all throughout scripture, you see times when people are given a vision. They're anointed. They have all this stuff spoken over them and it takes five, 10, 30, 40 years before they finally get to where God called them to before. And yet we get so upset if God tells us something and it doesn't happen tomorrow, right? Just wait for it. And that's the last one. Wait for it. That was the last thing. He said, for the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. It just might not be in the timing that you want it to be. But sometimes you have to learn to wait on the Lord. When you wait on the Lord, you will, I promise, be refreshed because when you realize, hey, you know what? I'm not trying to do this on my own timing, my own plans. I'm gonna wait on God. It is so much better when it finally happens. And for me, that's kind of where I find myself right now, talking about Radical Church 2022. Where are we going as a church? Okay, I know everybody's like, what is this word that he keeps talking about? What is the word? What is the phrase? What's it gonna be for this year? Almost there, okay? Because the Lord actually gave me this, not a specific word, but it was more of an idea, a concept last year of where he was going to be taking us at some point into the future, but it wasn't the right time. I had to wait for it. And in fact, he gave me a different word last year, and that word was harvest. That's the word the Lord gave me last year. And we asked God to bring people to faith in Jesus, and God was definitely faithful. And what I want to do right now is I want to show you some numbers and some things that happened last year that I think we could get really excited about. Last year, we saw 53 people say yes to Jesus at Radical Church. 21 people were baptized. We had 23 rad groups. We said last year at Vision Sunday, if you remember, that we wanted 21 in 21. 21 rad groups to be started in the year of 2021, and we had 23. You know how we were able to accomplish that? Because we wrote it down. We said, we want this to happen. This is what we're working towards. And now our team knows, hey, this is where we're going in this next year. And we were able to accomplish that. And now what I hope next that we see is we have 21 groups at the same time simultaneously going. Man, we're going to get there one day. I absolutely believe it. And then we saw 600 people come to our very first fall festival, which was so much fun. How many of y'all were at fall festival last year? Come on, that was a lot of fun in October. Had a great time. 
And we had over 200 people at Christmas and Easter services collectively. And then one of the things I'm most proud of, I think, of you guys this year is that we were able to actually save in the bank another $70,000 this last year, which I think that's, can you give yourselves a hand for that? Because y'all are such a generous church. You understand generosity. You know, we did the miracle offering and we're about to start dispersing those funds to all of our partners. And we're about to tell you guys all about that as we start giving that money out to our miracle offering partners. And listen, it was just incredible to see the generosity of this church over this last year, believing in what God is doing here and believing that we have a future that's better than where we're at right now. That's amazing. But that was last year. That was last year. And Last year, I felt like the Lord called me to cast a wide net, right? We were going to cast a wide net for people to find and follow Jesus. We were going to cast a net that's going to say, hey, anybody that is seeking, anybody that wants to come, please come. We'll introduce you to Jesus. We'll help you find your faith again if you've been doubting. This is something that we want every single person to have the opportunity to do. We want you to be able to find and follow Jesus. And, and that was something that we did. And we created a great community of people. We have these groups that, that are meeting together and people that have become such great friends. And when new people come in, they get grafted into the, into the culture and into the family. And we call ourselves the Rad Fam because I, I really do feel like that we feel like a family here at Radical Church. And I never want to lose that. That's amazing. We created some great community. But I knew that there was something that the Lord was calling me into and calling our church into but it wasn't the right time because there was just so many people that needed to hear about just Jesus for the first time. And I said, you know what, let's do that. Let's just go after people for Jesus. But I do have a vision for this year and, and it's, it's a word that the Lord gave me this last week. And I, like I told you, we've had conversations about this with our church staff and leadership team. And it's more of a concept and idea of where we felt like we wanted to go, but man, the Lord was kind of holding us back. And finally, over the last few weeks, the Lord gave me some language to have some common language with you all, to put some bones around it, to put some meat around it and have an actual vision statement for where we are going this year. And I believe that the Lord has called us into the harvest to see people find him, but now I feel like the Lord is calling us to go deeper with him. Our word this year is deeper. Come on, somebody give some praise to God. I'm diving in, I'm going deep. Come on, anybody Anybody there with me? Old, you know what I'm talking about? Old K-Love, 90s, early thousands, let's go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. That just like happened. All right, that's cool, that's cool. Um, but the Lord is taking us deeper this year. And he gave me two words to go along with that. And the first one is deeper devotion. Deeper devotion to the Lord. What is devotion? The definition would be love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. And I believe right now that God is calling us into a season of deepening our devotion to him, deepening our love for God, just a raw, pure love for Jesus in our everyday lives. Come on, how many of you want to love God more, right? Because the Bible says he first loved us. That's why we love the Lord. I wanna grow in my love for Jesus. And Deuteronomy 6, 5, it actually commands that we would love God, right? It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And now you might say, okay, I feel like I do that pretty good. I love the Lord with, you know, with everything I have. And, and, you know, but what this verse says is our love for God's not just a part of who we are. Our love for God should define who we are. It's not just a thing that we do on Sundays, but it's a lifestyle we live every single day. We come here one hour a week. Maybe you go to a rad group on a Wednesday or a Friday or something like that, or maybe you have a Bible study, whatever it might be. But listen, this is not something that is just a part of our schedule, a part of what we do in our lives. It defines who we are as people. And so the question that this verse asks is, do you love God with everything that you have? Do you love God with everything that you have? Some of y'all might be like, I think I do. I think I do. Hold on a second. We'll see. Matthew 10, 37 to 39 says this. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Oh, okay, Jesus. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. 
He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That's a powerful verse, right? It's a powerful passage. Go ahead and get Sadie or Pastor Tim on up today to close things out in just a moment. Jesus takes it one step further. He doesn't just say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's great. That's awesome. But he says, if you love your mom and dad more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your kids more than me, you're not worthy of me. And listen, I think that makes it a little bit more clear what that first verse was saying, right? Because that, that makes sense to us. We love our families, right? I love my son. Oakland is amazing. He's three and a half. He's crazy, right? But I love him, okay? And you might have some kids. You might have a mom and dad, and you love them so much, and now you read this, and you're like, okay, that, that seems harder, right? But really, it's the same thing that Deuteronomy 6.5 was trying to say, but Jesus actually makes it plain for us. Do you love Jesus more than your kids? Do you love him more than your family? Do you love him more than hanging out at the barbecue with them? Do you love him more than the Netflix that you get to watch in the evening? Do you love him more than your job? Do you love him more than your spouse and everything else that you have in your life? Because at the end it says, he who finds his life will lose it and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And so the question really now is, do you love God more than even your own life? Do you love God more than your own life? That's what I think devotion means deepening our devotion for the Lord to where we could get to a place that honestly we could be like the disciples of Jesus that at the end of the day almost every single one of them were executed for their faith in Jesus and I think if we really ask ourselves that question like if you had to decide in a moment would I actually go through if somebody said do you find do you do you love Jesus and they have a gun to your head what are you going to say right you know what I'm saying like what are you going to say and you have to be honest with yourself and ask that question because that's what happened to Peter and he denied Jesus three times. And he followed with, he was right next to Jesus his, for three years. And yet he still did it. And so how much harder would that be for us? We have to be honest with ourselves and say, do we have that devotion to the Lord where we would give everything for him? The next thing that I feel like God is calling us into, not just deeper devotion, deeper love for him, but also deeper discipleship. Deeper discipleship. So those are the two, deeper devotion, deeper discipleship. And discipleship is a word that we mostly use to describe Bible study, right? You think of discipleship, you think of Bible study, you think knowledge, you think theology. And when you hear it, you might naturally think, oh, these are all these left brain people. Okay, who's a left brain person here, right? You know what I'm saying? Who's a left brain person? You like math, analytical, all this stuff. You love all that. Okay, we got a few people, not too many here today. But listen, we got a bunch of creatives in the room, apparently. You're the analytical, measure twice, cut once, love the details. And you're the person, when I said discipleship, you were like, discipleship, let's go. Your ears like perked up a little bit. You're like, oh, we're going to have Bible studies. We're going to have classes. Sunday school, are we going to start doing Sunday school? We're going to tell people how bad they are and point them back to Jesus? It's going to be great. You know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of people that I think of sometimes. And you might think of when you hear the word discipleship, right? But I hate to break it to you. But just because you go to church every Sunday and you grew up in Sunday school and you know a lot of Bible verses and you know your theology has nothing to do with the fact if you love Jesus or not. Satan and the demons know everything there is to know about God and yet they're still on that side. They know a lot more than us. It doesn't make you a disciple. In fact, thousands of people heard Jesus preach and yet they weren't called disciples. In Matthew 5, 1 through 2, now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Jesus teaches the greatest sermon that's ever been given. It's a sermon on the mount. And it says, by the end, they were all amazed. And, and one guy comes up right after and says, Jesus, could you cleanse me of my leprosy? And, and Jesus obliges, of course. And he doesn't say, no, 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 you can't be you know, you can't be healed because I know you're not going to follow me. I know you're going to go back to your home or whatever it might be. You know, he, he says, absolutely. And he heals him right there. But I think a principle that we could look at today is there's, there's two different kinds of people in this story, the Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down and then his disciples came to him. So the question for us is, are you a part of the crowd or are you a disciple? Because the crowds want something from Jesus. They show up because they, they've heard that he can heal. And so they come so that they can find healing. And that's fine. I totally understand that. 
that's cool. Jesus is okay with that too. He says, you know what, I'm, I'm here to help with your practical needs as well. But the crowds want something from Jesus. The disciples simply just want Jesus, right? There's a big difference there. There's a big difference. And then a man, right after that, man comes up to Jesus and says, hey, you know what, I'll follow you wherever you, wherever you go. But if you wouldn't mind, just let me go back and bury my father first. And this is actually an important Jewish custom. This would have been something that was very important. Jesus would have understood how this was important, okay? But the crowd versus a disciple, when the crowds go home after the message, after they get their ears tickled a little bit and they go get healed and stuff, and then they go ahead and go on home, after the crowds go home, the disciples remain. The disciples stick around. And how did Jesus define a disciple, he defined it in this one phrase right here, come, follow me. And if you said yes, you're a disciple. And if you said no, you're not. That's how Jesus defined it. Now I know it's a little bit different because now obviously Jesus isn't here and we follow the practices, but that in that moment, that's what they would have called a disciple. So the question is, are you a disciple or just part of the crowd? And the crowd, I understand it. They might be people like some of you, maybe even here today, like, well, I'm, I'm in the crowd right now because this is just what I've always done. I've just always gone to church or maybe that's what my parents taught me to do or you might have something serious going on in your life and you're just like, I just need some encouragement today and, and that's why I showed up to church today. And, and listen, Jesus has nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to get something from God today. You need a healing. You're having a tough time. You need that encouragement. He'll give it to you, but that's just the surface of it. There's so much more, and it goes so much, dare I say, deeper than that. It goes so much deeper. Discipleship isn't just Bible study. It's daily devotion to Jesus. And the part I think that we miss so much about discipleship is we, get it, we think it's all about us. We think it's all about ourselves. Like me growing closer to God, me having a better relationship with the Lord, me understanding a lot more about God. It's about learning. It is about knowing the heart of God. These are all good things knowing who he's created me to be my identity. I find this through the word of God. That's amazing. But it's also about joining him, following him in the mission of what he was trying to accomplish, right? If we say that we're a part of the family of God, you know, we're a part of this organization called the church, right? And the church has a mission and it is to help people find and follow Jesus. That is every church's mission. It should be anyway. And the vision that Jesus has for you is very specific. But listen, you got to be on board with the organization in the first place. You got to follow him. You got to sign up to be an employee, right? You got to sign up to be on the battlegrounds fighting for Jesus, advancing the kingdom of God in every single place that you find yourself. It's about joining the mission. It's not just about knowing his word, but it's about joining and doing the things that he also did, becoming an active participant. So my question again, is are you in the crowd or are you ready to be a devoted disciple? Those are those two words, devoted disciple of Jesus. Are you ready to go deeper into the things of God or are you okay with staying on the surface? Some of y'all might say, you know what? I am fine with that. And you know what? You can stay that way your whole life. You'll still make it to heaven. But I'm not, that's not acceptable for me. And I hope it's not for you either because there's so much more that God has for you. In fact, we're starting a series called Deeper over the next three weeks. And I would hope that you would come back and go through this process because at the very end, I'm gonna issue a challenge called the Deeper Challenge to each and every one of us. In week one, the title of the message is Made for More. Made for More as we go into this Deeper series. And it goes along with this idea that we're dissatisfied with the average. I don't want mediocrity in my faith. I want to go deeper with the Lord. That's the first thing that you have to do. If you want to go deeper with God, you cannot be content with where you're at right now. Amen? You can't be content with just average. You can't be content with mediocre. We have to say, you know what? I am going deeper. This is what I'm going to do. And Lord, you better take me there with you. And it's going to get crazy. It's going to get weird. It's going to get fun. And that's what's going into the second thing. Second week is into the water. Because when you start to go deeper with the Lord, sometimes he might call you to do something like he called Peter to do, which is to get out of the boat and go walk on the water with him. And that's where most people stop, if I'm being honest. 
when it starts to get a little crazy, right? You know what I mean? Like, Jesus, I ain't trying to walk on no water. Are you crazy, right? Like, this is uncomfortable. This is weird, right? I don't want to get into this. Like, I said I wanted to go deeper, and I know I'm made for more, and I, re- I get all fired up about this, but then you get to that week two, right, realizing that Jesus might call you out into the water, out of your comfort zone, and then you say, eh, I don't know about all this deeper stuff anymore. I'm going to go back to just like average everyday Christianity, okay? That's what happens to most people. But then if you push past that and you say, wow, I'm realizing there's so much more. This is amazing. God's called me to this amazing life and and there's power and authority in Jesus by the power of his Holy Spirit. And I can really help to shape this world around me for Jesus. That's incredible. But then sometimes we get to the point where we don't realize that we actually do need that discipleship and that knowledge and growing up in our faith. Our zeal sometimes will outgrow our knowledge of God. And we get so excited about Jesus, but yet we don't really know anything about what's in his word. And so week three is milk to meat. And it's about growing up in Christ. Don't just be a baby Christian anymore. Come on. I know there's a lot of people that have given their lives to Jesus here at Radical Church. You might be watching online today. You might be here in the house and you might say, you know what? I would kind of identify as a new Christian or maybe I gave my life back to Jesus. And I'm just like, this is all kind of new for me. Okay. The Bible says that there comes a point when you have to move on from milk to meat. Why? Because milk is what we give babies. All right. And if you want to be a baby Christian the rest of your life, that's fine. You can stay there. Like I said, you'll still make it to heaven. That'll be cool. But listen, I want to grow up and mature in my faith. I want to learn more about the Lord, not just so that I can have the knowledge, but so that I can love him even more. Amen. That's what that's about. So we're going to go deeper into some concepts, into some topics, into some theology that I think is really important for us to know as a church. And I would just ask, will you come along with us this year? Will you come along with us this year? Come on, if you will come along with us on this journey to go deeper with the Lord, would you just say, I will? I will. I want to go deeper with the Lord, and I hope that you would too. Would everybody stand in the place today? I'm really excited about the next three weeks because it's gonna set the tone for everything that we're gonna do for the rest of this year. And there's some other things that I can't wait to tell you about over the course of the next three weeks that goes along with deeper. Some discipleship opportunities, some prayer and worship opportunities that we're gonna have this year to go along with this deeper concept. And I would just ask that you open your heart for the more. Open your heart to something that maybe you've never opened up your heart before. And then for some of you, you need to open your mind because you let your mind stop you. Just like Peter, when he gets out of the boat, he's following his heart towards Jesus because he loves Jesus. He gets out of the boat, but then he lets his mind take over saying, this is crazy. Look at these waves. Look at all this stuff. And I think week two is where you're really gonna have to push past it. That's where it's gonna be. But if you want to go deeper with Christ, I encourage you, please come the next three weeks and invite somebody else that you really feel like would benefit from this, especially next week, because it's all about identity. It's all about who you are, that you are made for more. God has a purpose for you and your life that's more than what you even think it is. So let's pray right now as we close out Vision Sunday, seeing where the Lord has taken us for 2022, and then we will get out of here. Come on, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that you speak to us still today. We thank you that your word never fails. We thank you that you've given us a word for this year, a direction to go toward, a rallying point that we're going deeper with you, that average is not enough. Mediocre is not enough. Lord, we want to know more of you. We want more of your presence We want to understand more of who you are, but not only that, we want to experience more of who you are. We want your power of your Holy Spirit to move in our services, to see healings, to see signs and wonders, Lord, to see amazing things happen in this community that doesn't just stay here, but Lord, we're going on mission with you, Jesus, and we're going to take this hope and this love and this joy everywhere that we go. As we grow deeper with you, we believe, Lord, that there's going to be so many more people that are going to find you and follow you. And we thank you for our families, for every family that's represented here, for every individual that's represented here. God, if they need a vision and a direction for their life, Lord, would you slow them down enough to speak to them and that they would hear the vision that you've given them, that they would remember to write it down, to make it plain, to run with it. And then maybe sometimes they might have to wait for it, but we know that your word never fails. 
We thank you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, we love you guys. God bless you so much. We'll see you next week. Women, make sure to hang out on Wednesday. And if you want to do growth track today, grab your booklet at the back and sign up. God bless.